it's just not possible to gain that much in value that quickly with declining revenue. And that's when I really had the epiphany that investing was not about stocks and bonds. Investing is about innovation. The belief is if there's a new piece of information, that it will be instantly incorporated into the price of the stock or the bond or whatever. But that's not how people change their minds. Welcome back. I'm Hayden Brain, and you're listening to Opto Sessions, where we interview the top traders and investors from around the world, uncovering their secrets to success. David Rosenberg is the President and Chief Economist and Strategist at Rosenberg Research, an economic and consulting firm he established in January 2020. David's CV boasts stints at Merrill Lynch, first as Chief Economist and Strategist for the company's Canadian arm, before a promotion to Chief North American Economist. From 2009, David was Chief Economist and Strategist at Glaskin Chef and Associates, pivoting from an institutional focus to cover the interests of high net worths. David gives us his outlook for Russia and the likely repercussions of their invasion into Ukraine and the resulting commodity supply squeeze. David gives us the odds of a recession in China, an economy marred by regulatory clampdowns and draconian COVID restrictions. And finally, we turn our minds to the US, contemplating the probability of recession there as the Fed attempt to stamp out rampant inflation. Enjoy. Welcome, David. It's great to have you on the show. So how are things in Toronto at the moment? Well, things in Toronto actually uh, are pretty good because uh, as I look out the window, uh, winter is actually over. It uh, took a while for spring to arrive, like a month, um, but I can safely say that uh, spring has arrived uh, here in uh, Canada. It must remind me, by the way, of a, of a joke about, uh, you know, why did God create economists to begin with? Uh, and it was uh, to make weathermen feel good about themselves. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, let's see. Uh, see how the uh, forecast match up today. Although we won't be able to test anything in today's uh, in today's uh, episode. I guess the future will tell. So, yeah, I'm speaking to you from uh, CMC's London offices, uh, based near Liverpool Street, right in the uh, in the city of London. So, I want to open today's conversation with a question that won't necessarily flow chronologically, but it will give listeners an early indication of one of the focuses of of today's interview. Um, And that is really to kind of identify, I suppose, what Rosenberg's edge is, how you might provide superior or perhaps more aptly, more consistently accurate economic insights than your peers. So if you can answer me, what what do you think Rosenberg's edge is, if you have one? Mm, Well, uh, I I think everybody likes to think that they have an edge. uh, And, uh, I'd have to think that, uh, and the one thing that you cannot replace in this business uh, of uh, financial markets and uh, analysis and forecasting is you can't replace experience. Mm. So I've got 35 years under my belt uh, in doing this. uh, And I think that I just had um, some very good mentors along the way uh, who taught me how to be relevant. Uh, for portfolio managers, uh, CIOs, uh, for people that actually have to put money on the line. How as an economist and strategist uh, do you make yourself relevant? And I've just always had this knack of being able to really map out what's happening in the economy to the markets and back to the markets to the economies because there's a symbiotic relationship between the macro and the markets. Mm. So uh, I think that's really, if you ask me for my edge, it's historically being able to take the economic data points, uh, create uh, a collage out of them and be able to see how the moving parts Uh, are signaling in terms of uh, shifts in the financial market landscape. So it's really connecting those dots between what I'm seeing at the macro level uh, to what the anomalies could be, what is not being priced in in those economic tea leaves at the market pricing level. Yeah, fantastic. And as I say, that's the topic that we're going to return to. I've got a few macro and economic developments that I'd love to get your insight on and then how they actually impact financial markets uh, today will be will be fascinating. So we'll hear more on that 
in due course. But let's take a step back and just introduce you to anyone uh, that, that isn't aware of your work. We've got a, UK, a lot of UK listeners as well, uh, so perhaps less familiar with, with the work that you do at Rosenberg. Um, and I did some research before the call, uh, looks into your background. It looks like you were chief North American economist at Merrill Lynch. Um, and that's kind of where I've decided, I suppose, to to start tracking your career trajectory, because I think there's a few more roles after that that are also relevant to today's conversation as well. Um, and I read that you were consistently ranked in the institutional investor all-star analyst rankings during your time there. So firstly, perhaps you can just tell us what sorts of calls you were making at Merrill to be uh, afforded such a, a title and such a ranking. You know, what what goes into the work that you did there? Well, look, well, thanks for that introduction. Uh, you know, just uh, maybe just by way of introduction, uh, I also was ranked, although I was the chief North American economist, um, when I got to New York for Maryland in 2002, uh, I also got ranked in uh, the European surveys, both on the equity side and the fixed income side. Okay. So uh, I always was very proud uh, about that, that although I was calling North America and principally people wanted to know more about the U.S., yeah. Uh, that uh, my client reach was actually uh, more than just U.S. portfolio managers and CIOs, but actually the mutual funds and hedge funds and banks and insurance companies uh, in uh, in Europe. And I used to spend several weeks a year there, uh, and especially uh, in London as uh, as well. Well, look, uh, you know, I really made one very big call, mm. uh, and so it's not like I made a series of calls. It's really sometimes how important is the call that you're making as opposed to the quantity. Yeah. And I was convinced that we were heading into the mother of all housing bubbles, uh, starting in 05 and cascading in 06. And then really starting in 07 was when the bubble started to burst. Mm. Uh, I was uh, hugely unpopular, uh, but it was definitely a view that was not consensus at the time. Consensus at the time was that we were into a whole new era of democratization of finance, uh, that housing was no longer a cyclical uh, segment of the economy, but that we were into something that was structural in terms of how mortgages were financed, affordability, uh, and that housing had become more like technology and more growth uh, than cyclicality. Mm. Um, I was just more concerned really with um, how housing, instead of being a place that you lived and raised your family, um, became a leveraged asset and um, got to a point when you're taking a look at uh, ratios uh, and you believe in mean reversion, it was clear to me that not only was housing comprising an unrealistic share of economic activity um, because it became an investment mm. as opposed to a, a consumption good, uh, but also uh, the home price action, the leverage in the home price action, everything was fitting into a bubble uh, characteristic. That was the big call. Um, the big call was that this bubble uh, was going to pop, which it did. It was a matter of when. Uh, bubbles last longer than you think, but they don't correct by going sideways. And this one certainly didn't. And so my prediction was that we're going to have a housing-led recession, you know, which we did. But in actuality, um, you know, uh, I think that uh, me and my team at Merrill, uh, we got ranked in in the II survey uh, four or five years in a row in the top three. And it wasn't because of our calls. And I never ever advertise that I'm going to get every call right who can. But the one thing I can guarantee is that I will always provide clients with very thoughtful, innovative research that is not a commodity and that they won't get somewhere else. That's something I can control. I mean, controlling the accuracy of your calls, well, Let's face it, a lot of that comes down to timing and luck. Uh, but thoughtful, unique, innovative research that will help investors think through the issues. Ultimately, they have to make up their mind how they want to put their money to work. But being that cog in the wheel to provide them with information that they won't get elsewhere, that to me is actually far more important than just making the call. Yeah, completely understand. And my next question was actually going to be, you know, was there a particular call that stood out, one that was a favorite or perhaps one that lived long in the memory for for the opposite reason but it seems like that housing call was was one that completely fits that description and really fascinating to kind of hear more more detail on that because I, I was vaguely aware of it uh, when I when I'd done that research prior to the call 
Um, I guess then if we can move through your your career to bring us up to present day, I believe there was a 10-year stint as chief economist and strategist at Gluskin Chef and Associates. And I wanted to to pull this out, I suppose, because as I understand it, you were now looking after kind of high net worth individuals and their families. And I just wondered how that altered the role of an economist, you know, particularly compared to your time at Merrill. Does does the audience that you're trying to service, you talked about being relevant to all the people that you're you're providing research for, you know, how did that how did that pivot affect your your focus? Right. Well, you know, that that is a great question. And um you know, you're uh, trying to find the right analogy. Uh, I mean, you're still, as the economist and strategist, you're still the protagonist in the play. Um, you just might not be on Broadway, but you might be somewhere else on stage. But the audience is still the audience, and they still yeah. want to be entertained. And the audience in this particular reference is really about uh, uh, investors, whether it's retail, as they're called, or institutional. Uh, and so I would say that everybody wants the answers to the same questions or they want the same issues addressed. It's always about government policy, interest rates, inflation, where are we in the cycle, exchange rates. You know, the one thing in our particular business is that the questions never change, but the answers do. And of course, the answers come down to, you know, where exactly are we in the cycle to a very large extent. But it, yeah, you're 100% right that um, that the my client focus shifted from call it more of an institutional base towards more of a retail base. Uh, but, you know, whether or not, you know, you're the uh, senior long only equity portfolio manager at Fidelity, uh, you know, or whether or not you're a, a successful entrepreneur in Montreal uh, with your money, say at a, at a Glaskin chef or at a money manager, uh, you still want to find out, you know, how are we going to make money in these sorts of markets? Uh, what are the tea leaves telling you at the particular moment of time? What are the issues that we should really be most concerned about? So, you know, you'd actually find that uh, a lot of the presentations that I, it was interesting is that I was still in the speaking circuit. Um, I mean, I had a business within a business when I was a Gluskin. So, uh, and that's how I started Rosenberg Research was that I still had, I had 2000 clients globally that weren't clients of Gluskin Chef. And most of these were institutions. Funny, a lot of these um, through the paywall, a lot of my clients at Gluskin Chef uh, were actually competitors with Busk and Chef. They were also, uh, and and a lot of them were former clients of mine when I was at uh, when I was at Merrill. So it goes to show that uh, you know I would have the same say slide slideshow on a Tuesday in Toronto to Busk and Chef's retail clients, and on a Thursday I'd be in New York giving the same presentation um, to my subscribers who would be portfolio mm -hmm. managers. Uh, so it's really uh, doesn't really make much of a difference. An investor is an investor, whether or not you know you're you're doing it from home and, and you have a, another business, you're an entrepreneur, uh, or if you actually do it for a living and you're a CIO at some big fund manager. It's pretty well pretty well the same. Yeah, fantastic. Well, that sets us up well then for a conversation that will be going out to predominantly retail investors, although we do have some intermediaries and institutional listeners as well. Um, and I think we can use this juncture to return to the theme outlined in the opening question, which is, of course, what makes Rosenberg tick? Uh, you established Rosenberg Research in January 2020, I read. Uh, so talk to us about why you decided to found the firm. Was there a eureka moment, perhaps? Well, I, I guess that there was a eureka moment. Uh, I mean, firstly, I mean, Gl Gluskin Chef got bought by um, a private equity and, and debt firm uh, called Onyx. My contract with Gluskin was coming to an end. And um, I was, to be honest, aching to get out and, uh, and, and strike mm -hmm. out on my own. Uh, I had no shortage of offers. When word got out that I was leaving Gluskin Chef, there were no shortage of offers from uh, other institutions to come on board. But, you know, I was, I was pushing 60. Uh, I'd only worked at big uh, companies. And there's actually, I learned a great deal of Gluskin Chef because it was after many decades on the sell side, I mm. went to the buy side and uh, for, you know, I was there for almost 12 years. And it's amazing how much I learned, how much you can learn as an economist and a strategist when you're sitting with the portfolio managers 24 seven and you figure out how you really do become relevant uh, for the decision-making process. Because I thought I had it all figured out at Merrill Lynch. Um, but just because, um, you know, I did that for that period of time. And before that, 
at the Bank of Montreal, before that, the Bank of Nova Scotia. These are big multinational corporations, but on the sell side, the buy side, I actually figured out a whole lot of things. And a lot of it was what makes the brain of a portfolio manager or an investor, uh, what makes their brain tick. Uh, and of course, you just figure out that it's just one giant probability curve. And so you always have to weigh the options. Uh, so what I learned the most was really when you asked about before about about the secret sauce for me and for Rosenberg Research. Well, firstly, mm -hmm. it's being humble and understanding that um, there is a base case scenario, but it's not the only case. So what I learned after 12 years on the buy side uh, was that if you don't have a plan B, you don't have a plan. So you have to scenario build. You have to basically have your base case scenario, but you have to scenario build and be ready to exit your call um, when it becomes obvious that it's not working. So you have to set down disciplined markers as to when I will get out of this call. Because one thing I did learn is that you will be forgiven. You will be forgiven for your mistakes because we're all human. Um, but you won't be forgiven for making the same mistakes twice and for not having an escape plan. So uh, I, I learned that. You know, in answer to the Eureka moment, you know, it's interesting that when I left Merrill Lynch in 09 in New York and came back home to Toronto, I had no shortage of people coming up to me wanting to partner with me to set up Rosenberg Research. Um, but, you know, I didn't want to have that, uh, you know, I was moving back from New York to Toronto and, uh, you know, I had a young family and uh, I was, uh, you know, Really, I was in Toronto, in New York, and living out of a suitcase for seven years. And I just wanted to reestablish some mm -hmm. stability in my life. So I opted for Gluskin Chef. And it was a, a good idea at that point not to rush out and start my own business. I actually don't think I was quite ready yet. I really need to get that seasoning. Even though I was turning 50, I needed to get that seasoning of really getting the experience working with the investment team at Gluskin Chef and really figuring it out. Um, and so the answer is yes, you know, the timing was right. My contract was coming to an end at Gluskin Chef. I had already had the ability to stress test uh, the Rosenberg Research model because although Rosenberg Research didn't technically exist, it was not a legal entity, uh, I did have, call it uh, 1,800 subscribers in 40 different countries. So I already had my own subscribers. This wasn't Gluskin Chef's business. Gluskin Chef was not running their money. These were my subscribers. These are people that want to pay to hear my voice. So I was already started the business playing from the front tees, you know, as they say in golf. <laughs> and so I didn't have to start building refrigerators from scratch. I had a bona fide business to start. Uh, so you're quite right. It was really a, a matter of when, you know, people said to me, you know, that I would, I, I, once I started the business, people said, and they were right, they said that uh, you'll be saying to yourself, you know, why didn't I do this earlier? And, and they're right. Uh, but you can't cry over spilt milk. The reality is that I started it. The timing is funny a little bit. As you said, January, January the 6th, 2020, next thing you know, less than two months later, we're in lockdown <laughs> mode with the pandemic that we all <laughs> thought at the time was the bubonic plague and we've worked remotely. So imagine starting a business, uh, you know, my staff didn't know each other. Uh, we did have office space in downtown Toronto. We had to basically, you know, turf that out and we're all working remotely, but it's gone incredibly smoothly, I have to say. But you're right, it was a eureka moment. It is, uh, you know, I've got three sons, you know how they say, and it's true that, you know, it's hard to even remember once you have kids, what life was like before you had kids is like a blur. Mm. And I'll tell you that on a professional basis, what life was like before I started Rosenberg Research, which is almost like having a baby <laughs> and you nurture it. Uh, but life, a type of professional or Rosenberg Research is also a blur. Um, but yes, it's been 100%. It's been a blessing. It's been a, it's obviously a challenge. Um, the research business inherently is a commodity business. And um, information, there's so much out there with social media and the internet that you can get for free. You really have to prove yourself. So I've always told my staff, and this goes back before, it goes back to Gluskin, and it goes back to Merrill. I always told my staff, we have to consistently be unique in the marketplace, which means that we have to um, uh, look at the world differently. Uh, and we have to always uh, try and look for things in the data and the markets that other people aren't going to find. Uh, so I've been trained as an economic and financial market detective. I have tried to teach my staff to do the same thing. And that's really the secret 
of success to a large extent is, uh, is being able to differentiate yourself in a marketplace like my business, which is financial market and economic research. Uh, differentiate yourself in a market that uh, is so familiar and so easily accessible that you have to make yourself unique. So with that said, um, yeah, the, uh, that eureka moment came after I left Busk and Chef. Uh, we haven't looked back, and uh, the business is doing fine. Uh, and I appreciate you asking me that. No, oh, that's great. It's really fascinating just to get the background of kind of where Rosenberg began. And um, just to dig into to your approach at Rosenberg, because I think that will set us up nicely to talk more on a macro basis and about what's going on in current financial markets. Uh, the the kind of mission, I suppose, cited on Rosenberg's website is you're there to provide investors with a unique lens on the macroeconomic and market developments that are shaping the financial future. And I just wanted to dig into to one term mentioned within that mission, which was unique lens. You were talking about Rosenberg needed to be unique, needed to be differentiated to your peers. But if we can just, I suppose, dig into that, what what exactly makes Rosenberg unique? You know, what forms that unique lens? I imagine there's several things or factors that go into that lens that you apply to uh, global economies and, and financial markets. So perhaps you can tell us more on that. Well, look, there's there's a like a, a broad, big picture view to that. And then you get down to the more micro level mm. and the more nitty gritty. I would say that, um, you know, from a big picture standpoint, it's really trying to identify where are the most overcrowded trades? Uh, where is market pricing seemingly so certain? Um, and so I always try and assess any given moment in time, what exactly is priced in? Mm. What is priced into asset class A, asset class B or C? We drill down to the sector level, subsector level, corporate credit, equities, commodities. Uh, and look, I've done this most of my professional life. It's just you continue to work on getting better and better, mm. developing more and more models, uh, better models. But I've always figured, yeah, how do you look? The bottom line is, you know, how do you help people? You know, so I've spent most of my life and I continue to try and identify what's priced in to these various asset classes. Because we're talking about here being an economist that's trying to help investors make money or save money. So I try and assess what is being discounted. And then you have to also examine uh, you know, what the probabilities are. And that's where you put your economics hat on. And that takes experience. It takes assessing patterns in the past. You know, What is different this time? What is the same this time or similar? It takes a lot of work. So the financial market aspect of it is figuring out what's priced in. The economic aspect of it, we're talking about connecting the dots, is assessing what are the odds that this asset class is going to get it right. So if you have something, let's say you're looking at the stock market and the stock market is telling you that there's only a 10% chance of a recession happening in the next year or two. But then we do our work on the economic side and we say, no, 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 hold on. There's more like a 75% chance. I mean, understanding there is no such thing in this business as zero or 100. <laughs> Everything is shades of gray. There is no black and white. <laughs> In the financial yeah. market business. But that's where the value add is. The value add is to go to measure and say, look, I don't know if you own this sector, if you're along this sector, but here's where you should know if you are along this sector. Uh, this is really the economic environment is priced for. Our work is saying that this is the economic environment we're more likely to get. Uh, and so that's really, you know, the, the, the nuts and bolts. I mean, over and beyond everything else we do, we try and cover big picture issues. You know, we could write, we just wrote a whole report on, on what life is like without Russia for the global economy, as an example, even, even mm. after the war is over, which will end at some point, what Ukraine looks like. I mean, who knows? But, you know, we've done all sorts of work on demographics. I mean, we try and take a look at the, at the world holistically and take a real bird's eye view. So we're more than just, say, forecasters. We're also critical thinkers. And we're all, always trying to look at the forest past the trees. What are investors not looking at? What are the issues that like you're taking a look at all the articles on the front page of the New York Times, the Financial Times, the Wall Street Journal, Barron's? What is the, the key is identifying what is the page B16 news 
that's going to make it to page A1 in the next year. Because page A1 news mm. is already in the price. It comes back to what I said before, identifying what is not priced in and identifying what is priced in, but probably too much. And we do that across the capital structure and we do that globally. So that's really when you're asking for the secret sauce without me actually having to go through the individual models that we use internally, mm. that's always the thought process. Yeah, fantastic. That's that's absolutely fascinating. And that, you know, that's one of the key themes within all of the interviews and opto sessions to kind of dig into people's strategies and to really understand their their philosophy, their underlying approach that maybe separates them from peers. So that's exactly what we wanted. And I think with that, we can move on to a couple of uh, your popular uh, report formats. Uh, I read uh, a couple of the examples on your website. This is stuff that people can sign up to and pay for. And uh, I think there's a few really interesting uh, excerpts that we can pick out um, from from two of those. The first one is your strategizer. Um, and within that, there's a US equity model uh, that for April 2022 showed weakening forward returns coming in at 34.5 for the end of March, having closed February at 37. Um, and Firstly, I just wanted to understand, you know, that that seems like a really interesting, useful number, really actionable for the investors reading that report. So firstly, just can you explain how that's calculated and then we can work out what that actually means for markets? Right. Well, it's based on uh, a history of Z or Z scores uh, across a gamut of ingredients that go into equity market uh, value determination. Uh, I just want to say that I... I created this when I was the chief strategist at Merrill Lynch Canada mm. uh, back in the late 90s, early 2000s, before I went to uh, New York, where I became the chief economist. And uh, this was absolutely, this put me on the map uh, in Canada at the time. I only did the TSX and the sectors. Mm. It was always my dream, when you talked about a Eureka moment, it was always my dream to revive uh, this model. And uh, so when I started my business, that's exactly what I did. I, you know, I didn't have a budget to do this when I was at Gluskin, but I have the budget uh, to do this at Rosenberg Research. And it took oh, uh, six or nine months before we back tested everything, wow. before we actually uh, started publishing uh, the results uh, back in, uh, in early uh, 2021. Uh, so it's a, a heat map. It really tells investors is the light red, amber, or green uh, for going along the S&P 500? Mm -hmm. We also do Canada, we do Europe, we do Japan, we do Japan X Asia, we do emerging markets, So, and we do sectors. So we cover, like I said, sectors and the whole gamut uh, geographically. Uh, you're talking now about the S&P 500, which of course is you know the cornerstone of what most people gravitate to right away. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's a it's a it's a range of Z scores that uh, contain technical analysis, um, earnings fundamentals. Uh, it includes la liquidity measures, momentum measures, uh, and when we drill down to the sector level, also specific industry fundamentals. You know, especially what the order books look like. So it's got um, sentiment, technicals. Uh, fundamentals, valuation, and uh, we put that all together into a model. Uh, and we have a, the range score, which is the amalgam of all the Z or the Z scores. Mm. And it'll give a number. It could be a number could be twenty, a number could be eighty. You know, it's um, it it could be something. It could be a zero or a hundred. I mean, that's uh, that that that's those those are extremes. Mm. But what we try and do is we try and at least capture what the color code is. Uh, what is it a shade of amber, which means, you know, not danger level yet, but uh, maybe it's a hold. Green is is a step on the gas and go long risk. Uh, and then of course red is um, is be a, be underweight. And so uh, and I urge people on the call. You know, we uh, you'd mentioned before to go on the website. We also offer a one month free trial. Yeah. of all our research because we really want people to we find it very valuable for people who become our clients uh to know what they're getting so we give a free one month trial uh so you have the opportunity to kick our tires uh and it uh it works out well but that's the strategizer and i want to keep in mind that uh you know we do it uh for uh for government bonds so we have a bond model bond duration model built very much the same 
equities, equity sectors. Uh, we also do the currencies. And now we are moving because we continue to add chapters in this book. So now we're, we're actually introducing very soon a corporate bond model, a corporate spread model uh, on top of this. And the ultimate goal will be to develop, and hopefully this will be done by the end of the year, a global asset allocation model that will come out of this. Oh, fantastic. So we're still, we're still, we still have the building blocks. I would say along with Breakfast with Dave, which is my, you know, I like have McDonald's would call the Big Mac. This is <laughs> like the Big Mac of the firm is the daily that I've done for 20 years. Mm. But Strategizer is uh, for, for if you're an asset allocator uh, or well, if you're a global investor or you like to move in and out of sectors within the stock market, um, this is a uh, very useful tool. Yeah, absolutely. And that's certainly the way it came across to me. I think for comparison, I suppose it'd be interesting to highlight that this number was at 95.3 in March 2020. And obviously now, as I said, we're down at 34.5. If we go back to March 2020, uh, this was when the S&P 500 went on to actually add around just under 20% by the end of 2021. So similarly, you know, would it be accurate to assume that we can expect a similarly bearish downtrend now given the number is so low or perhaps you can just advise on what this means for investors what what can they extract from this number in terms of their us equity exposure well what it, the strategizer is constructed uh on a 12 month forward return basis uh, so what it's telling you is that returns for the coming year in the broad equity market uh, are going to be low single digits that's on a 12 month view. And of course, within the 12 months, we're going to have peaks and valleys along the way. So we also, uh, in my daily, uh, we have a, a momentum indicator. And again, this was actually clients of ours said to us, it's nice to have the 12 month expected returns. Uh, but what about it? I mean, we could be, you know, we, we could be talking about, you know, the S&P is going to be either flat. I mean, the strategizer is saying we're going to have a flattish market. Um, but on a three to six month basis, people will say, well, what do I do for the next three to six months? So we actually have a uh, short term momentum model that's built along the same lines, but the time horizon is shorter. Of course, the shorter the time horizon is in these models, uh, the less robust they are, but at least it gives a bit of a guidepost on the very near term because it is our, our short term models are telling us that, yes, the strategizer might be saying low single digit returns between now and say April of 2023, but there's going to be Obviously, lots of churning in the market along the way, but it's our short-term momentum model right now is squarely in red. Uh, so it is saying that uh, that although the year ahead is roughly flat, uh, there is more downside risk on a very near-term basis. So you have, really should be taking a look at, at both, but uh, we had to stay consistent and I uh, found historically that they're the optimal time horizon for most investors is just tell me what's going to happen in the next year. That's how Strategizer was constructed. So we can get a little bit more granular. Uh, and on a daily basis, we say, well, what are the near-term wiggles going to look like insofar as you want to make any near-term adjustments or trade around the market, uh, uh, not on a year-to-year -year basis, but more on a, on a month-to-month or week-to-week. -week. We have that capacity as well. We hope you're enjoying the episode. For interviews like this every Thursday, subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And while you're there, make sure you give us a star rating and leave guest suggestions along with any other feedback in the review section. Now, back to the show. Fantastic. And that's available within that Breakfast with Dave uh, report that you mentioned. Um, so both of those reports, uh, as you mentioned at the start, are available with this um, uh, free trial. Uh, and then obviously people can sign up to the full thing if, if they wish to do so. We'll put a link to that in the episode description just so people can find that easily. I think that perfectly sets the scene then to move on to, I guess, what I've termed within our, within my interview agenda, your macro outlook. Uh, we can go around a few of the key financial markets just to get your perspective on what's going on there and in global economies too. Uh, I listened to your recent interview with Stephanie Pomboy earlier this month, um, and you talked about Russia. You mentioned it earlier. Obviously, the invasion of Ukraine is, is something that nobody will have missed. And I think you referred to it as a game changer in that interview, which, of course, it's proving to be. Um, so if we take Russia independently for a moment, what do you think the chances Russia defaults on its debt for the first time since 1918? This is something that's been covered quite heavily in, in the big publications. So was keen to get your perspective. Well, I, I think that um, 
it's as in this whole realm of nothing's ever zero or hundred, it's as close to a hundred as you can probably expect. And in some cases you could argue that the defaults already happened since um, some of these payments that are dollar denominated have been made in rubles. Yeah. Um, and quite a bit of the debt has already been downgraded to distressed uh, by the major agencies. So you could argue that uh, this process is already well in train. Um, so I give that um, it almost uh, as close to 100 as you possibly get. Uh, and, um, you know, every cycle plays out differently. Of course, that was a cataclysmic event uh, back in uh, 1998. Uh, it's definitely when you consider who's holding on to this debt, an added big negative for the uh, European mm. banks. Um, but uh, it seems as though very similarly, you know, you could ask me about, you know, the defaults uh, and the implosion in the, uh, in, the, in the property market in China. Uh, and again, that was a financial event. Didn't turn into the sort of 2008, mm. you know, um, global uh, systemic financial risk uh, that we had at that point. But the, uh, the Russian debt default, in answer to your question, is a, if it's not a certainty, it's, it's a near certainty. Yeah, well, let's get into then, I suppose, the, the likely repercussions of that default. You know, it's it's happening near enough and it's it's potentially already happened, as you say. But first, firstly, let's talk domestically for Russia. What are the repercussions of that? How is that likely to play out within the domestic economy? Well, look, I mean, this is uh, when I was talking with Stephanie about um, about Russia-Ukraine being a game changer, it was much bigger than just, uh, you know, uh, Russian, uh, you know, the Russian bonds, uh, and uh, Russia is already experiencing a, a, a deep recession, and 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 you could argue borderline depression. Um, but it's not the first time Russia has entered into a very deep economic downturn. Uh, they've had several, and the one thing we know about the Russian people is that uh, they know pain, mm. and uh, they can bear pain. Um, and uh, it's actually striking that uh, when you look at the independent polls, they actually show the vast majority support Putin, uh, although who knows what information they're getting. Yeah. But th- that wasn't the major point. The major point is um, about how important Russia is as a commodity producer yeah. for the world. Uh, the fact that we went into this crisis uh, with uh, European dependence on Russian energy being as acute as it is. And of course, I don't think most people understood how big uh, and how important Ukraine is, uh, especially when it comes to rare earth materials and what's important, especially uh, for the semiconductor industry. Uh, We all of a sudden realized that neon gas is something that's very important uh, at a time when semiconductor supply chains have been totally disrupted because of the pandemic. So uh, it was more along the lines of what this means for the cost curve. Uh, global supply chains, um, then what happens geopolitically, because no matter what happens coming out of this war, Russia will be a pariah and outside the global economic system for a prolonged period of time. Think of what uh, Germany was like after World War I. Yeah. The difference is that Russia is a massive commodity producer. Uh, and obviously also along with Ukraine, very important producer when it comes to agriculture. So we have an added hit towards a major crisis globally, uh, which is the uh, the food crisis mm. and, and the implications this has for emerging markets, uh, for the Middle East, um, and even for low and middle income households, uh, the elderly, uh, you know, even in the industrialized world, what's happening on food uh, is a major tax on uh, on wide swaths of the population so it's much bigger than just a russian debt default and people say well but russia is a small economy and so on and so forth inconsequential well not really and then we have to take a look at what's happening geopolitically um that actually how this uh special relationship between russia and china has evolved yeah uh, how china you know uh commission through uh, omission uh, has been a supporter of sorts for Russia. India has been silent. Um, so you've got a, uh, and of course, China might come out so much the better so long as they play their cards right. You don't want to spit the Americans in the eye. Mm. At the same time, uh, they emerge as a buyer for cheap energy and cheap resources with their relationship with Russia. 
Uh, so China's got its own agenda, keeping in mind that if we weren't talking about Russia right now, you and I would be talking about the economic Cold War that had already been established between China and the United States. Mm. So geopolitically, this just adds you know, a different layer of complexity to the outlook uh, for the global economy and for the markets for many years that transcends any near-term gyrations for the European banks uh, you know, from a Russian debt default. It's much bigger than that. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm glad we got into the global kind of repercussions, not of that debt default, but just generally what's going on with Russia, Ukraine and how that affects uh, nations and regions around the world. Um, And you mentioned China there. I wonder whether we could just quickly turn our minds to China. I mean, you've got the combination of a regulatory clampdown, draconian COVID restrictions, a reluctance to fully turn the easing taps back on, I suppose, has led to uh, a stifling of growth for sure. But added to to the description of the global economy that you just eloquently gave us, is there a recession in China looming? And what would the likely repercussions uh, of that be to, to, you know, the US and global economies around the world? Mm. Well, yeah, it's a great question. Well, well, of course, what's happening in China is this this renewed breakout uh, of the uh, coronavirus. And of course, um, there are Beijing's very aggressive uh, zero COVID policy. So you tend to find at least every week, there's a new city with 15 million people or more that's been shut down. A lot of these cities are port cities that are very important for the global supply chain. So it hits, um, it cuts both ways. What's happening in China hits global demand. We just saw, for example, uh, you know, the IMF, you know, cut its global GDP forecasts from 4.4% back in January to 3.6. That's almost a full percentage point move in global GDP in a matter of just a few months, uh, rarely ever happens. So China uh, seems to me, looking at the high frequency data, China is entering into at least a, uh, a brief recession as a result of this. Uh, and so that's already happening. On the other side, uh, you got to be thinking that, you know, and I'm going to come out and be viewed as, uh, as being bullish on China, <laughs> uh, but maybe... You know, we're about to actually publish a report uh, on China because uh, China's going through a, a, a very significant transformation. And, uh, you know, whether you like China, you don't like China, if the name of the game is to make money for you, your children, your grandchildren, you can't ignore China. Mm. And uh, the point I'm making is that um, they, they are making a significant transition uh, to slower growth structurally. Uh, but more stable growth, slower, but more stable growth. Uh, the slower growth is one of the reasons why I'm not one of the big permables on commodities, notwithstanding all the narrative on the greening of the world and the shortages of raw material. There's a huge correlation between Chinese domestic demand and the commodity sector. And uh, China is going to go through many years now of much slower growth deliberately, uh, but much more stable growth. At the same time, You know, as um, every single central bank in the industrialized world was blowing their brains out on quantitative easing and jeopardizing uh, the sanctity of their balance sheets and the the governments were ramping up their deficits in a massive way, it's very interesting that China didn't do any of that. Uh, They didn't massively fiscally reflate uh, their way out of the pandemic. They didn't didn't cut rates all that much. Uh, They didn't enlarge their balance sheet like the Fed did. Uh, imagine that the, the the capitalist country went all the way out to be buying high yield bonds um, <laughs> in this cycle, and the uh, you could argue that the, the the communist country, maybe a communist country that discovered the color of money, uh, didn't do any of these interventions that these other central banks did in the developed world. You can, I mean, I'm sure that you know history will be filled with books about what happened here. Mm. China's got the capacity now to ease monetary policy, as the Fed does the opposite and other central banks do the opposite in the industrialized world. And they have much more capacity to ease fiscal policy, uh, which they probably will do as well. Uh, on top of that, nobody talks about, this is what I'm talking about when I say, no, you know, everybody's opened up to page A1. Uh, today's page A1 news in the Wall Street Journal was on how the, uh, the quit rate is going up and that uh, the low-end wage earner is mm. seeing a massive explosion in compensation growth. That's fine. But nobody's talking about the Silk Road, you know, the, uh, the Belt Road Initiative in China, how China strategically, you see, as everybody else focuses on months or quarters, uh, you know, everybody else in the world seems to play, you know, checkers. 
China plays chess. Uh, and um, so they have already have a stranglehold in Africa, in South America, through their Belt Road Initiative. They have made strategic uh, alliances and initiatives uh, to get the rare earths that they need. Uh, that's the, the, the whole raison d'etre of this new relationship with Russia is really all about economic. Maybe it's a case of my, my enemy's enemy is my friend. So this is a new, when I say geopolitical, we have something brand new and a new, uh, a new Cold War between, uh, between uh, you know, major powers uh, vis-a-vis the West. People will say, well, you know, but coming out of the Ukraine, the Russian invasion of Ukraine is this uh, stronger alliance between the U.S. and NATO, and that's probably true. But it's U.S. and NATO now against uh, China and Russia and perhaps even India. Uh, so it's something that we haven't seen before, at least in the post-World War II period in this sort of complex geopolitical environment. But China, they have the capacity to ease monetary policy as everybody else is tightening. They have the capacity to ease fiscal policy because there is no Joe Manchin standing in the way in China to get things done. And when you're taking a look at uh, 5G, or you're taking a look at uh, at nuclear, or um, or moving towards more sustainable energy sources, China is uh, is is light years ahead of everybody else mm. uh, in terms of next generation technology and energy policy. So um, there's tremendous amount, and we're publishing a report on the on this on, on Thursday uh, on uh, the new investment opportunities in China. And the question is, do you want to take advantage of them or not? I mean, politically, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's difficult to do, but if the name of the game for our investors is to, in a diversified way, uh, take advantage of opportunities that don't exist in other parts of the world, well, uh, they actually exist in China, whether you like it or not. Yeah, absolutely. Well, if we, we finish that China section on them potentially having... Uh, the possibility for sort of medium term, long term growth and strength within that region. Let's turn our minds and finish the episode by, uh, I guess, getting your outlook for for the US and potential recession there. Obviously, we saw recession during uh, the COVID peak. Uh, since then, you know, it's not looked particularly positive. But I'm interested to get your take. Uh, I saw a tweet that you put out possibly earlier this week, uh, maybe uh, maybe the end of last week, where. You highlighted the consecutive six months worth of negative real wage prints and a 13% correction in the S&P 500 employment services. And I guess they're both working. I think you described it to exacerbate the already uh, the, the problem, sorry, already faced by the downtrodden consumer. Uh, and it's something that I think we're experiencing in the UK. Uh, but should we expect a sharp slowing in job growth ahead? Uh, what's, what's your take there? Well, in, a, in answer to your last question about the job market, once again, it comes down to, as I said before, this symbiotic relationship between the macro and the markets. Mm. I'm taking a look, for example, at the fact that uh, the S&P 500 employment services subsector is down around 8% uh, from its recent highs. Uh, I like to look at the market internals to tell me what's happening in the economy. I look at the economy, of course, to also see what's priced into the stock market. It's a two-way flow. Uh, And so the stock market, the behavior of the employment stocks, they're not behaving well and they're leading indicators. But again, it's it's you know more to the point of um, trying to identify, you know, what as I said earlier, what are we seeing that we've seen before? What are we seeing that we haven't seen before? Mm. Uh, I'm not gonna go here and criticize the Fed because I was in I was in team transitory. And in fact, I'll tell you right now, I remain in team transitory on the inflation side. It's just a matter of that. I mean, you say that today and, you know, it's like you have leprosy. It's rather (laughs) incredible. Um, I I think people tend to forget that we were bumping up against 6% inflation back in the summer of 2008. And of course, it wasn't eight and a half, uh, but we've had a couple of very big shocks here. But remember the shock back then was Chinese double digit growth. They were buying out more than half the world's resources, oil. Prices were pressing against $150 a barrel. Mm. Uh, the debate at Merrill Lynch, uh, which I was in vociferously, was about whether we're going to have global decoupling, which I always thought was a bit of a joke. Um, and we went from almost 6% inflation the summer of 2008, a year later, a minus 2% inflation, minus 2. Um, 
we've been hit with a, you know, the last time that we got hit with a double shock like this, and we're talking about, you know, look, this is the first shooting war in Europe mm. in 80 years. This is big. And it's the law of unintended consequences. Who knows uh, where this is really going to end? Uh, the first shooting war in Europe in 80 years, and of course, um, the first global pandemic of this size in over a century. Uh, I actually would say that um, last time we had a, a war and a global pandemic was, you know, back, call it, uh, you know, in, in, over a century ago. We had uh, a world war followed by the Spanish flu. This time around, we had, uh, you know, the um, COVID-19, you know, followed by a new war. And, and it creates on the near term a tremendous inflationary supply shock. I mean, we had in the lead up to 2020, we had four years where inflation averaged 15% per year. Four, mm. a 15% per year inflation. And then for the next 10 years, once the shock subsided, inflation averaged less than zero. So uh, the point I'm making is that I thought the Fed had the story right. I think they bungled the job in terms of um, trying to explain what transitory really meant. Mm. Um, and uh, you know, nobody ever put a timestamp definitionally on the word transitory. But the Fed is clearly, I mean, they've, they've pivoted again in a major way. You, you could not have read uh, Jay Powell's speech from Jackson Hole last August to the dramatic shift in policy right now. I mean, to go from there to talking about 75 basis point rate hikes, let alone 50, uh, to me, it just boggles the mind. Uh, but they seem to believe that their credibility is under attack. You know, we're seeing, you know, what's happening in terms of these China lockdowns. As I said, the initial impact is on supply, the escalating war in the Ukraine. These are recurring supply shocks at a time when we just came off, you know, the pandemic domestically. So. It's true that we had a massive fiscal impulse and massive stimulus, but that's in the rearview mirror. Uh, so I'll just say this much. We ran a model trying to assess where we are in this economic cycle. We looked at 17 different market and macro variables to assess their pattern of behavior through the cycle going back to 1950. And so this is what we do when you ask about what makes us different. We were able to ascertain and even though this economic expansion is only two years old, believe it or not, the pattern of behavior in the market and the macro variables are such that we are 82% of the way into this economic cycle. In other words, it's almost over. Mm. People say to me, but it's only two years old. Well, it's not about how old you are. The recession was only two months old. It really smacks of the double dip that we saw back in the early 1980s, which is really relevant because we have Jay Powell now comparing himself to Paul Volcker. <laughs> And that was really quite a lot of information when it is to and fro with Senator Shelby at his, uh, at his um, congressional testimony uh, less than two months ago. He compared himself to, to Paul Volcker. Well, Paul Volcker killed uh, supply-side-led inflation uh, through oil by engineering back-to-back -back severe recessions. So I imagine that is where the Fed's going to take us, although they won't say it openly, but let's just call it for what it is. Usually when the Fed starts a tightening cycle, GDP growth is over 3%. We're going to get a number this Thursday. GDP is going to be around 1%. Normally, when the Fed is embarking on its first series of rate hikes in the cycle, the yield curve is in a bear steepener. This time around, usually the bond market leads the Fed. The bond market is the one that tells the Fed you're behind the curve. Mm. Um, it didn't happen this time around. This time around, the bond market has followed this aggressively hawkish tone um, out of the central bank. Uh, normally, the yield curve twos tens, and so far as that's still relevant, I, you speak to people in bubble vision or uh, you talk to the Fed, they have a different yield curve they want to look at. But twos tens is what I look at. It's uh, you know around 20 basis points spread right now, so it's not inverted. That's fine. But usually when the Fed starts tightening, that curve is 120 basis points, not 20. And there's there's never been a time where the Fed embarked on its first series of rate hikes in the cycle with all the major averages below the 200-day trend lines. And so we, we've never had a stock market. We never had a yield curve this flat or the stock market this week. And, and then you're taking a look at the different sectors of the market. Home builders down 32%, home furnishings down 40%, retailing is down 20%, the banks down 23%. So you have, when you look at the domestic cyclical segments of the stock market, they're mm -hmm. telling you 
Well, they're telling you that we have a 50% chance of a recession and the Fed's just getting going. So I would say that, uh, you know, our numbers are closer to a 80% chance of recession. Mm. Uh, the market's really priced more for a soft landing right now. That's why we're, we're still very cautious. And, uh, you know, the only other thing that I would say is that, you know, we are into right now the mother of all tightening cycles, because when you actually count in what the futures market is discounting, and then the planned balance sheet reduction by the Fed, mm. you know, we're talking about a combined 450 basis points of de facto rate hikes this year. Wow. And then you trace that through what it means for GDP growth. It's about a two and a half to three percentage point policy drag on growth mm. that, by the way, accelerates to negative five and a half percentage points in 2023. So you see what I'm saying here mm. is that when we trace this through into an Oaken's Law type of model to predict where the unemployment rate is going to be going by the end of the year, we have it at around 5%. Call it four and a half to 5%. We'll have it in a range. The Fed's at 3.6%. So that's where you build in from taking the economics taking the policy shock to the economics to its near and dear to the Fed's heart, which is the unemployment rate. Now, that might be what the Fed wants to see because Powell went on record as saying that the labor market's just way too hot. Well, by the end of this, the question really is for investors, how hot will it be by the end of the year? Well, we have uh, roughly 5% unemployment by the end of the year, which means for sure, well, let's just say almost for sure that we will be in a recession, not in 2023, but the second half of this year. How, therefore, do you want to be invested? And that's really what we are writing about day in, day out right now. Yeah, fantastic. And I don't think I could have asked for a better, more sophisticated, sufficient answer to my question. You know, the possibility of a US recession is, and then you brought in a lot of different financial markets and equities too, which is really important to our listeners. So thank you very much for that. And I think actually it's the perfect message and outlook to end on. Uh, we've, we've used up probably far too much of your time already. So thank you very much for joining me on the podcast, David. It's, it's been a real pleasure. Well, Hayden, thanks so much for inviting me on. And it was a pleasure to uh, share this past hour with you as well. Thanks for listening, everyone. Just a quick note before we sign off. If you're looking for an easily digestible daily update on the markets, this might be of interest. Opto Updates is our short newsletter sent every day during the trading week, giving you a bulleted list of the top seven stories from the global stock markets. We've done the hard work for you, highlighting relevant opportunities and trends. And in addition, we'll also keep you notified of any new products, stock reports, or webinars from the Opto world. If you're interested, sign up using the link in the show notes. And thanks also to CoFruition for consulting on and producing the show. Until next time. Co-fruition.